YOLO Composing Gloves here. And today we will be talking about the Fruity Multiband Compressor. This is actually a redo tutorial. I have done a tutorial for this already, but I know a lot more now. and can just explain things more simply. So it is a multiband compressor. And what that means is it takes whatever signal we give it and it splits it into three bands. And you can see them represented here as a low band, a mid band, and a high band. And then we can compress every one of those bands individually. Now, uh, just a real quick recap for compression. In, in a compressor, we set what's called a threshold. So here's the volume level that we have currently. There it is, right? And I can set a threshold. And you see it's just a line that appears. So all it's going to do now is says, if, if you pass my magic blue line that we call the threshold, turn down the volume by some amount. And that amount is controlled by the ratio. So, you know, we'll put down the ratio and we'll say, for example, uh, three to one. That means for every one decibel, you go past my blue line, turn it down to by three. Or for example, 100 to one. That means that for every one decibel, you pass my line, you turn down by 100. So an extremely high ratio, as you could see, I get a very sharp looking curve, basically saying, well, check it out, it, it, will, it won't even hardly get past it. It turns it down by a ton, and this purple region represents the turning down. But if you see here, we have this little spike, and that spike is controlled by our attack and our release. So just because it passed our blue line, we need time to react to it. And so we tell how long for it to turn down. So we could have it be more gradual and we see that our spike gets longer or very long spike. You see, it, it hardly even works because it takes so long for our attack to turn on. So this turns, this controls how fast. And then once it's gone back above our line, we have a release time to tell it how long to turn it back up. Because if we've turned it down, we've taken away volume. If it goes back below our line mode, we've got to give that back. But the problem is how long? Do we give it back immediately? If we don't, we could get pumping sounds because, um, I mean, if we do give it back immediately, we will get these pumping sounds because the volume will swoosh back up as soon as it goes back below our blue line. And it's not great for this example because I have just a straight saw wave. It doesn't fluctuate in volume right now. Um, and then sustain just is, it has to do with basically how it accomplishes these um, volumes, it, it, basically interpolation. Don't worry too much about sustain. You don't see that control on every compressor. So uh, basically, that's what we're going to be doing to things in a multi-band kind of way. Instead of doing this right now, you know, we're processing the entire signal in one go. But in a multi-band compressor, we can split it into three signals. And there are various reasons why we'd want to do this. Maybe we're working with a kick sound, and we would like to compress the low end and bring it up. Because the low end has that boom, you know, that low end... Uh, the, the main frequency of your kick and to make your kick sound bigger and longer you may want the low end to be extended so you'll compress it um, and then turn that up and so what that has the effect of that's a good that's a good thing the common way compression is used is we will compress something that has volume fluctuation in it so here I've got a song that's got some fluctuation in it and as I compress it I'll set a threshold let's first see where our volumes are at so maybe I want to get rid of these peaks. And the idea is we're going to squish our dynamic range. We're going to take some of the peaks off and we're going to then turn the overall signal up. So basically we've squashed it and then we've just pushed the whole thing up. We, so for example, I'll take my threshold down and I have a pretty severe ratio. So it's going to cut these peaks off and uh, we will have reduced our dynamic range. That's it, that's it, that's now we notice that it's not working too great and that's because Perhaps these are faster than our attack can get to. So we will turn our attack down and hopefully that will get rid of these peaks for us. Dancing, dancing, dancing. And we actually see it's beginning to work a little bit. If we bring this down, perhaps a bit more. And then also let me, yeah, just make sure it's on, you know. Dancing, dancing, dancing. So these white spikes that are going down are the compressor turning down our volume. So that's what these white ones are. So we can see what it's doing. And this is really important. In a sound that goes, you know, up and down like this, there's going to be, it's not going to do exactly what you think it's going to do. Now, if you do want to just cut these straight off, 
you could go to a limiter and just bring what's called the ceiling down. And it's able to look ahead. It actually puts a delay on your signal so that it can have time to process it. So you don't hear it very audibly because it's a very short delay, but it's enough for the computer to say, these, these levels are gonna be above our threshold. So turn these down. And so it's able to, to pick the samples in our signal and just turn them down for us. And so that's the value of a look ahead limiter. Now this can be very bad though, because this, this represents you know the punch of our kick and the punch of our snare, the hi-hats and the transient moments in our track that give it excitement and create that dynamic punching sound. So we don't necessarily always wanna just you know take peaks off of signals. Um, and that's, that's the art of compression and mastering. And then we could talk for a long time about when you'd want a fast attack and a slow attack. Uh, and I also want to really quick just give a good demonstration. So this thing right here, this ratio also has a knee control. And you see the knee just basically makes it smoother. Or actually, I have another compressor. I think this is better to show it on. But I want to just show you when I have something below my threshold, if I have a fast attack, that means, right, as we've discovered with a high ratio, it's going to turn it down very quickly. And so as soon as it goes past my blue line, my attack setting is going to start compressing. Dancing, dancing. As we can see here, it is doing its job, except for it missed this piece. Don't know what was up with that. And then we have a release control that gives that volume back. Well, if we have this really slow and this thing is going up and down from our between our lines, um, what happens is, is the attack turns it down, brings it below the threshold, then the release brings it up because it, the attack brought it down and it creates this loop and it creates distortion. It actually starts turning the volume up and down faster than the than audio rate. And we hear it as a distortion. Dancing, dancing, dancing. And so you can particularly hear it on the kick and those those bump, bump, uh, horn sounds. If we bring it down even further, it's very apparent. Dancing, dancing. So it's this interesting distortion that gets much worse as we go. Actually, if you bring the sustain up, the interpolation will have fewer sample points to work with. I actually go I actually turn out a bit smoother. And you can see that this line is a lot more stable. So that's what that's a good demonstration of sustain. So, anyways, uh, attack release. I've had friends who, when they mix hi hats, they love to put a hi hat in parallel and do this configuration to it, do a really crazy distortion via compression. I've never been a really big fan. It works out on some claps, but uh, yeah, just because it sounds like in this scenario, it's not something we want, doesn't mean it's not unusable. You'd be surprised where it gets used. So anyways, there's our, our wrap up of compression. So we're all, all on the same page of some of the techniques so that this, when I talk about this, has a little more meaning here. So we've got three bands now. So. Uh, and that was a lot more visual. This is not going to be nearly as visual. So basically, let me demonstrate the bands. So let's, uh, I have these low band, mid band, and high band. And I'm able to, the A stands for active, M is for mute, and B is for bypassed. So I'm going to mute band, the mid band, and the high band, and we'll be able to hear the low band. Um, let me turn the compressor on, of course. So here, whoops, here we have our compressor. Did I turn on the correct compressor? I did not. There you go. So there's our low band. Um, and now we can process that signal via this, um, whoops, I didn't want to touch that. Via this guy right here. Oh, that's interesting. Let me set this back to default. I've done weird stuff. Okay, where well, I'm taking now, you notice I'm messing with the display. If the speed is at zero, you could see the crossovers. Now, I don't recommend necessarily changing this because there is a specific crossover that has to happen in order to represent your whole frequency. Like if I do something like this, this area is now not included in my spectrum. And now I've got an issue because if I were to play this, I'm missing this piece of my spectrum. So you don't really want to mess with this. Other uh, multiband compressors will actually, when you move the midband, the high band will adjust as well. Maximus does this. So if I were to look at the bands, if I change the low band, which is this red one, you see the orange band stays the same. This way, my entire signal is always, you know, I can always hear it. 
And so that's a really important thing. This one does not do that. So if you pick this, you got to be kind of careful with how you do this. I don't know if there's like a keyboard command that allows me to move them at the same time. But anyways, so there's our lows. We can process that by themselves. Let's mute the high and the low and just listen to the mid. So this pink band. The mid band has particular importance because your ear is extra sensitive to the frequencies in this band, specifically the frequencies between about 2000 hertz and 3500 hertz are ranges, especially where vocals are concerned, are very important. Neurologically speaking, we're sort of engineered to do this because this is our, these are the frequency ranges we talk in. Um, so there are also, another interesting thing is these bands, these frequencies can be softer and we'll actually hear them as loud as low frequencies because our ear, the way it's built, actually naturally um, amplifies these sounds. It's really kind of an interesting read if you ever get into it. So that means that what we do to the low, it makes a lot of sense to do the low separate from the mid band because the mid band for the clarity of our track is going to be treated differently than the low, the low end would. And then, of course, we have the extreme highs. Um, these by themselves usually are not that pleasant to listen to, but layered in the sound, they are important. So I'm going to mute my low and my mid, and here's the high band. And you see, you can hear the upper mids. That's uh, with the dance and dancing, but just barely. And this is important. It adds like it adds clarity. Your so high bands. What your brain does with high frequencies is it uses those to determine how close things are a lot of the time. Um, so if it's a clear, crisp, high sound, it's as if someone's whispering in your ear. But if it was like a, um, a washed out high sound, it usually indicates a very large space with a lot of reverb. So it just depends on things like that. So there's a little bit of the idea behind what we're doing here. And so when we run something through the Fruity multiband compressor, we are concerned with adjusting these bands. And typically, you'll grab a compressor of this kind when you are preparing to master a track or do some really sort of transparent tonal shaping. Well, what do I mean by transparent? Well, let's go back to our saw wave here and let me demonstrate. So there's these controls here that when before I got into any sort of digital signal processing really baffled me as far as understanding them. So there was a jump cut just now, but the thing that baffled me was the infinite impulse response and the finite impulse response filters. Because they're, they're actually kind of a technical thing, but they're super easy to understand in the context of a clear example. So here I have our saw wave again. And if I run it through an infinite impulse response, check it out. We get this sort of messed up looking saw wave. And if I were to um, turn off this, we say, well, this was our original signal. And if we turn this back on, well, that's quite a different result. What's going on? Well, I don't want to talk about the details, but basically an info, infinite impulse response filter relies on a kind of feedback and it results in, there's actually a bunch of kinds. This isn't the only, this like, there's various ways to accomplish an infinite, impu, info, infinite impulse response filter. Um, so uh, you, but as you can see, there's an interesting result occurs. And so this is fine for a static example. That's what's going on. And this doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Actually, you might have a number of plugins like Maximus does this on its own. There's all, a whole bunch that will actually implement an IIR filter and as a result, produce sort of a different outcome. But you're processing the signal because you want it to sound different. Now, in the case where your signal is a static thing, like for example, we just have a static saw wave, the result will be quite an audible difference. But if our signal is moving around, we saw that in the compression example, compressing the saw wave, you know, the release didn't do anything. There, was, there were pieces of the equation that weren't moving, and so the equation was simpler. Well, here we've got things turning up and down, and so it's going to be triggering the infinite impulse response filter differently for each band. And as a result, the, the you know, extreme shift we saw here won't be nearly as audible here. Like you can, you can hardly tell if there is a spot you will tell. Usually it's going to be given away in high frequencies, like hi hat lines or crash cymbals or low things that have very transient responses that your ear is very sensitive to, such as um, uh, kick, kick drums, kick drums. Oh, you also might be able to detect it in the resonance of voices. Those are the places I would listen for. And a lot of times you still can't even hear it. 
So when you're using it, your ear is your final guide. And of course, the more severe of the filter threshold you pick, the more you attenuate it, the more you'll begin to hear this difference. So if I turn it, turn all the thresholds down, it will attenuate them. And we can see our, our compressors are working. The amount of compression being done is shown in this little C. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit more about how to uh, understand what you're looking at in meters in just a second. But right now our infinite impulse response filter is working. And so we turn it on. Now let's listen. So let me go back to the saw wave real quick and turn these all back to basic. And so now what about this other option? This is a finite impulse response filter. It does not need a feedback loop to work. And you see that one comes out the same. Now the question is when we compress what happens? So let's turn these down and see what happens with compression. So that's what we get. Let's do the finite impulse response. We notice the shape changes very similarly. But the difference gets a lot harder to detect. It's still there for sure. And if you open it up, you can totally hear it. But um, it's just a lot more subtle, a nuancey type deal. And this is, again, not a moving signal. As soon as we're going up and down, each, each filter has its own sound. So your ear is its final judge. But for technical reasons, when we're mastering, we may pick a finite impulse response filter just because deep down we know this thing preserves what's going on a little bit better than this one. And that's the reason why someone would say, oh, I'm going to use this one for the final master. It's because if you've done all this mixing and gotten everything just the way you want, and then you slap this on there, it's, uh, it's going to be a noticeable change uh, in some cases. In some cases, like I explained before, it may not be a noticeable change. Maybe you'll really enjoy it, but there's some reasons why someone say, oh, pick this for mastering. That's, that's a possible reason. So let's uh, go ahead and let's hear this difference. So first, let's pass it through at Unity and see if we can hear any difference. Dancing, dancing, dancing. She's a dancing she and now we'll do finite impulse response. And listen for those things. Dancing, dancing, dancing. Hi, now listen for the listen to the high end. It's actually surprisingly different. Dancing, dancing, dancing. She's a dance. Right here. This one sounds like um well, it's a phase difference is what's causing it. It sounds like a little bit more mellow. Like the low end has has, uh, or the high end has been reduced. See it there, it sounds a little more mid-driven in the highs. Not nearly as much. So these are subtle things that I encourage you, and of course we need our filters to be working to hear this. You can see the compressors are turning on. Um, and so I encourage you to mess with this. Not, And in this case, it's not a matter of like such a distinct difference. In this case, it's more a matter of subtly literally using your ear and subtly choosing things. And the fact that you're using one filter over the other gives you a hint on where to listen for the differences in the in the signal. It'll come across much more clearly on like large systems and stuff where, where small differences like this, when they're amplified, you know, they're going to make a big difference in the long run, especially when being amplified. So I don't know why I said that twice. Anyways, that's what the two filters are doing. We also have a limiter here, and it's going to do like what I showed you earlier with the fruity limiter in that it sets a dead limit, so stuff just can't get past it. And then all the same tricks apply here. We can have a fast attack and a fast release to create a type of distortion. We can have a really heavy threshold. And then the gain, so let's go to a, a single band compressor to make this more clear here. So let's go back to the limiter because it's very visual. So... Here we've got our compressor, and let's say we want to compress this. So if we take it off, you know, let's take away some of these peaks here. With the rather fast attack, and let's turn our threshold up. Now you see here, we're really affecting the punch of our kick. And so this is, this is not something I would recommend doing. Usually when you're mastering, you're aiming to, you're aiming for a feeling you want the kick and the punch to still be there. So we'll usually have our attack raised up a bit. That way it takes time for our attack to turn down, but then we have to have our release short enough that it's able to turn up before the next kick hits. So it's, um, it's this juggling act you have to sort of play through. Uh, so generally, you know, I'll, I 
seek to compress a, on an individual track basis. And then when I'm mastering, I'll go through and I'll look for little moments. Cause what you want to do is you, you mix it to the best of your ability to like some level, usually negative six decibels. And then you're going to bring that up to unity. And when it's at unity, you are then going to skillfully shape away pieces of the spectrum. That's why we'll target like the mids. And this is where the click of the kick will live and the lows we might, will do differently. And we know the lows need to be a bit louder than the mids and in the master room, we'll sort that out just a little bit further all the way. We have to have it ready for, you know, the stores. And so we're going to chip away at it skillfully. That way we can increase the average level, the average volume level of our track. Uh, doing things this way allows us for our track to sound generally better. Us as humans like loud things that are consistently loud. Um, we generally consider those better. That's just the way things typically tend to be. And it has produced a thing called the loudness war, which is now being counteracted um, because if something has more clarity and punch at a louder level, we'll perceive that better if the average loudness is equal to the average loudness of another track. That's why things like when Spotify does equal loud loudness matching, the more clear track will now win in this case. And that's the track that actually sounds way better anyways. If you were to pump it up, it's going to sound a lot better than the one where things have been squashed dramatically. Like, just this, it sounds like trash. Like, if we turn this and just squash it horribly. And let's not kill it with the uh, attack. I mean, the release and bring our sustain up. There's no dynamic range. The dancing loses a lot of the characteristics of the original performance. It's just, it's, ugh, you know, but it sounds better at a lower volume level. So for like listening music in the background, you know, there's gives and takes. I could actually talk for a long, there's like, there is so much. I could teach a class on this, like for how much psychoacoustic stuff there is to consider and what setting you're in. Is this a video game thing? Is this something for pleasurable listening? Are you producing for a big dance club? Every single one's different and you're going to want to consider different aspects of this equation. So compression goes a long way. You can tell why some people are sort of like, uh, they look when they see the settings of your compressor. They they sometimes they think really hard. Sometimes it's as simple as just setting up a three to one compression at a reasonable attack for your vocals, and then moving on with your life. It just depends. So, anyways, that's what we have going on there. And I wanted to talk about this gain. So what we'll typically do is we'll take these peaks off, and we'll bring our threshold up. And now that we've compressed it to a degree, we will I'll make my knee really sharp. Now that it's been compressed some, we'll now turn it up on average by bringing up the gain. Dancing, dancing. And now it sounds much louder on average than we did before. Dancing, dancing, dancing. Even though we've lost dynamic range. So we've lost some punch in some other things. And there are ways people will try and keep those because there are psychoacoustic tricks to use to make those appear there too. So anyways, all these things are things that you should be considering, or at least have in the background of your mind, and you're just using your ear setting these. So that's the idea. We'll compress it and we'll bring it up just a little bit. Now we could do it on a per band level. So we could take out like some of the mids here. So let's say we want the ratio to be a bit more severe here. And let's turn this compressor off and turn back on this one. And so let's, uh, let's go ahead, let's look at this track and let's say, all right. Let's bring my ratio here up. Let's actually bring it down a bit. We don't want it that severe. We want now when we're mastering, we don't want out we don't want high ratios. We're trying to just get a, a bit of headroom in a way that makes sense. So we're gonna set all our thresholds at unity for now. Dancing, dancing, dancing. And so let's say, well, let's see if we can bring the kick out. Let's that's a good exercise. Let's just see if we can make the kick stand out and somehow still fit in the track, but bring it up and bounce just through the use of multiband compression. So let's say, well, this is our frequency band. I'm going to bring my ratio up just a smidge more and try and get my compression hitting about there. Dancing, dancing, dancing. So that's the spot I'm aiming for. I want my attack. Hmm. Well, if I turn the gain straight up and my attack is slow, the attack of the kick is going to just be straight up turned up, but the sustain of the kick will be brought down. So I'll get a punchier kick. So I could just do this and that would be my result. Dancing, dancing, dancing. But then I also have all the other stuff in the low end. So I can't necessarily go that route. 
Maybe I'll turn the attack really high up and the release down. Dancing, dancing, dancing. And I get more of a sustained type of kick. Dancing, dancing, dancing. And I, as you can see, it was really hard. That's why mixing is a separate stage. You want to be able to do things in isolation. I have people who send me tracks that um, they send me a wave track that I'm like, oh man, this needs to be like remixed. This is this is a, a mess to work with. Uh, so, anyways, so there we go. Maybe we want to take off some of the highs. So let's uh, let's settle on on something like. And now we see there's a tremendous amount in the mid band. So let's see if we brings down some of this. We've already got our compressor working to a degree. So. Honestly, this is already pretty okay. What you do is you'll generally apply a stage of multiband compression considering these things, and then you'll do a stage of limiting where you'll turn on this limiter and you'll start using it. Usually you want to do that in a separate thing. And I have an instance of ozone that's got a little more nice of a, a view for how this works. So here's ozone, and here's a multiband compressor inside of ozone. And we could see the compressor here. So the volume levels come in, and then if it hits a curve that's going down, that means that it's turning it down. And the, the slope of this curve represents the, uh, the ratio at which it's turning it down. If you, uh, I, when I was new, that phrases like that really threw me off. Basically, if the steeper this line goes down, the more it turns the line down by. You can actually define it as the slope of some line. And we could do that for each individual one. So you see, this is actually by default. They shave off the top little piece if your stuff is peaking at zero dB. Dancing, dancing, dancing. So they just shave off that little smidge. I'm usually okay with what they do here a little bit. But you see they have a limiter built in and a compressor built in at a two to one ratio. And we can, you know, we can bring this down. We can actually just grab the graph and it has the effect of moving this down. So what this means is I can grab this line and visually see where my stuff's peaking. And then I see the red represents the compressor turning on. So if I want it to be pretty severe on my low end, and you see it really brings it down and it's gone a lot more through this line here. Now, if I want to change the slope of this line, I will go to the ratio. And um, whoops, that's the limiter, the compressor, please. As you can see, it changes it. And we can also go backwards and actually turn things up, but that's called expansion something for another day. And then finally, knee. I've, I've not been talking about this knee thing, but uh, there is a knee principle. It does not seem to have an effect on the graph. So I have another compressor that does show the effect on the graph. So here is M Compressor Melda Audio Productions. It is actually a free compressor. You can go get it on their website. And on here, we have a... Uh, so... Here's our compressor, and we can see that it's it's uh, actually in the form of a limiter right now, meaning that when it reaches this volume, anything that goes past this volume will hit this wall and be turned down severely. And we can change this by adjusting the ratio, but it's not adjusting the ratio. Do I need to have it on for it to work? You do. Wow, that is strange. I did not know that. So there it is. It's on, and we can see that it's moving. And if we run yes. stuff... They, they don't have a nice background thing. I'm sure they do probably if I turn on the... If I turn on some sort of... A, they have settings for days. I'm sure there's a way to do it. They also have a metering thing so we can see it. Dancing, dancing, dancing. And so this is kind of cool because it visualizes the envelope, I think, a little more clearly in some ways. Uh, and what we have here is we have a knee mode. And so I'm going to make my, my pretty severe and I'm going to bring my threshold down, which has the effect of, you know, bringing the curve down. So more of it will be hitting uh, the way we turn down our volume. So as our volume progresses through, we see that it actually does get louder if our signal goes further. But it's got to get a lot louder, our input signal does, in order for the output to get just a bit louder. So let's bring this down quite a bit. And now if we had a less severe ratio, it does it still gets it gets louder much faster, but it's still been reduced by some factor. Dancing, dancing, dancing. And what we're gonna do is I just want to show you how the knee changes things. So right now it's as soon as it hits this, bam, it's it's being turned down by the appropriate amount. But we could have what's called a linear knee. And as you can see, that has changed how our input is affected. So things actually get affected before our threshold. So that's an important thing to know. We could also have a softening. So we see that the transition past our threshold is a little more gradual. 
And of course, probably the king of showing this is Maximus, but it also has a variety. This thing right here is amazing, but I can't talk about it in fullness uh, quite now just because it's so dense. I have a whole separate series on Massive. So, or Maximus, not Massive. So here's a knee, basically. I've created a knee, but it's like a two-stage knee. That's why this is so crazy. So I'm going to delete this. And so here's what we had before. And then if I were to simply sort of adjust this, it's like I've changed the knee of the curve. Things gradually get louder. And this makes a lot more sense because we hear logarithmically. And you can look up, I have several videos on the logarithm scale and how it affects us because we hear frequencies logarithmically. And we also hear... Um, Sound logarithmically, but sound log sound logarithms are different than frequency logarithms because frequency logarithms are base two, and sound is not. I can also do things like this. So now you can sort of see why Maximus is an insane tool on its own. But this is basically equivalent to messing with the knee, sort of. Um, when you're messing with a compressor, you're not going to get curves like this. Like you're just not. So I generally I'm going to shy away from Maximus now. But now you get the idea. So hopefully you should have not only a good idea of the, what the controls do in Fruity Multiband Compressor at this point, you also have an idea of why you would grab it, what it's used for, various ways of using it, and various additional aspects of compression. Now I do want to give some insight real quick onto the way to sort of view your meters. So these meters work similar to how um, this was working. If I turn this off, I mean back on. Um, hey, why aren't you, uh, oh, do I need to have, this is the correct plug, right? Oh, wow. I don't know why it's, uh, turning out. Oh, I paused it. There we go. So we can see this. And if I turn down my threshold and then I turn my knee up and my, now you can understand sort of with the knee, that's pretty visual too, right there. I don't know why I didn't use that, but give you a lot of examples of plugs and how they're implemented. And so we can see this curve, it turns down and then it turns back up. You could see this compression bar as this curve just being read out. So it says, well, at this moment in time, you know, the compression would be reading, you know, up here, it would be very high because the compressor is turned on and then it turns off and then it turns on a little bit and turns off. So we're basically looking at this line. And so if we were to turn this on. That's that's what we're looking at. We're just looking at that over time. And the same thing with the input. It's like we're watching, here's our, you know, dance, and, and this is the input to our signal. Well, that's what's going to be read out right here. It actually would match. And this actually shows you stereo information. So it's uh, in calculus, we would call something like this an instantaneous relationship, meaning that it reads out the instantaneous volume level here, where when we look at a graph like this, we're able to see the over time, because we were able to see time on one axis, we're able to see the entire uh, history of the loudness just right here. Like, there it is. That was how loud it was. And this is uh, like right now, we have no idea because there's nothing happening right now in, at this instant. And so for this reason, we'll say stuff like this is instantaneous. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool because it carries with it a bunch of other implications. So anyways, there you go. So if you were to use this, you know, set your settings and then adjust your gain afterwards according to your desire. I typically will do this in a second stage though because it's a little more clear. And you might, the reason you'd grab this one over another is you like the sound of this one and it's got these unique filters. There are a number of plugins that have their own implementations. And a lot of people have different philosophies about how each plugin affects things. For a plugin, you want to make sure they dither properly and do a couple other things. Because if you're going to stack them in a chain, anything one plugin does, it might not matter if it was the only plugin in the chain. But if you put it as a, a whole bunch of them in a row, it could then start to matter a lot. And so you just want to make sure that you've got nice stuff. But a really popular thing to do is shave off one dB with one plugin. And we haven't even talked about this one. As far as I know, it's aimed at being transparent. But some, like the Fruity Limiter, carry with them saturation options, which are types of distortion and clipping, which is like something we will talk about some other day. Anyways, I think I've beaten this to death. Hopefully, you've got some good ideas of how this is used. I tried to pack it in with everything I thought I wish I had been presented to me in a manner like this. If you have any questions, let me know. Subscribe and have a blessed day. Back
walking down the street with the black concrete. I was lowering my shades in the middle of the night. I felt like I was here, like I could steer. But then the triple came into my sight. Colors fell and shapes appeared. I saw what it meant to disappear. What I thought was you was me. We all felt it.